and further us with thy continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally, by thy mercy, obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Peace be to this house from God who is our Father. Peace be to this house from His Son who is our peace. Peace be to this house from the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Amen. By the authority vested in me as pastor of this congregation and in the Church of God, I rededicate and declare the chancel of this St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, Hallowed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
A reading from the prophet Ezra, the third chapter. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, the son of Zozak, and the rest of their brethren and priests, and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem, began to work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua, with his sons and brothers, Cadmael, with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God. The sons of Hendadai, with their sons and their brethren, the Levite. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, and his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout, and they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. Thanks be to God. Amen.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dearly beloved in the Lord, there was not such an exquisite, beautiful, wonderful edifice in all the ancient world as beautiful as the Temple of Solomon. People came from miles around to see Solomon himself in all his wisdom and his temple in all its beauty, overlaid with gold, pomegranates, beautiful angels, rich stones, metals, all working together to make this a gorgeous edifice with two huge pillars in front and the labor and inside the furniture and the curtains and the hangings and beyond those curtains everyone knew was the Holy of Holies, the place where God himself dwelt. This glorious edifice marked the whole nation of Israel for a long time. In fact, even when the temple, when the nation split in half, the northern kingdom, many of them knew better than to follow their northern kingdom's ways, and many of them came back to the south, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the place of God. And so it was for hundreds of years, until because of the apostasy and sin of the people of God, the Babylonians came in and overran the city and destroyed that beautiful temple and carried away the Israelites captive to Babylon for 70 years. And there was no more temple. It was gone. Until finally, a new generation was allowed to go back and rebuild. It was a difficult project, a difficult time, but it finally began to happen under the command of the king of Persia. They finally began to rebuild, rebuild, and they laid the foundation. And everyone overjoyed, rejoiced aloud, and sang, and were thrilled in heart except for the older priests who remembered the first temple and remembered how much more exquisite was that temple. And probably because they knew why the temple was destroyed in the first place and saw here the foundation for the second temple built. Not quite as beautiful by a long shot as the first. So the people who heard all this cheering and at the same time heard the weeping could not discern the noise of the joy from the noise of the sorrow. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. What does this mean? Why was this that the second temple was not as beautiful, not as glorious as the first? Zerubbabel, the governor, who was upset about this, was told by the prophet Haggai to take heart. He knew, Haggai knew why there was sorrow Remembering the house in her first glory, he said, and how do you see it now as nothing in comparison as what it was? But he encouraged him and encouraged the weeping priests, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. 
saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. How could it be? The second, second temple was smaller than the first. And yet this unmistakable promise that the glory of the temple would be greater, an eternal glory, an eternal peace given through the temple, not really fully understood until Jesus came and said, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. And his followers began to learn that, as he said, a greater than the temple was here. Now those words, a greater than the temple, are not merely words of comparison, but words rich with meaning. A temple like the temple, only greater, is here. For he spoke of the temple of his flesh, his body, the true temple of God. For within his flesh is the divine nature. And Christ our Lord is both God and man in one person, in the flesh. The incarnate one is no creature but our creator. And all this was foretold already by the building of the first exquisite temple of Solomon. And now it begins to make sense that the temple should be destroyed and that the temple should be rebuilt. And on the large plane of history, we see yet another image, a divine image of the death and resurrection of our Lord in the flesh. No wonder the second temple was smaller. It wasn't the real temple, nor for that matter was the first. The real temple, the real dwelling place of God is the flesh, the body of Christ. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten Father, of the Father, full of truth. The temple is Christ. It is his flesh, his body. And that is why we began to build churches, not as other temples. That is no longer needed. The image of the reality is no longer in play. The reality is here. The body of Christ has come. And so also the body of Christ is given routinely to the people of God and comes to us again and again from the holy altars of the churches. The church buildings, the cathedrals, the wonderful buildings that have been built through the ages, and yes, also this beautiful building, are not temples. They're houses. They house the temple. For the true temple sits on the altar. The true temple is given out to the people of God to receive by mouth the body of Christ, which was sacrificed and raised from the dead, is also wondrously, mysteriously given to us to eat and to drink. The true temple, therefore, we ingest and become living temples of the temple. So therefore, on this glad occasion, we are pleased with the rededication of this chancel, but we do not call it a temple. We call it the place where the temple is. The temple which sits on the altar week after week, which is why the altar is the center point, the center piece of this entire edifice. For Christ's body sits there and radiating forth from there, therefore you see the stone chancel floor 
the sanctuary. You know, the sanctuary is really a reference to this area, not where you sit, that's the name. For the radiation out from the sanctuary, from the holy place, is from the altar, from the sacrament. It radiates out from the word and the sacrament. And so there's this great arch in which you see shields of the 12 apostles who preach these truths and whose preaching is filled with the Holy Spirit who is depicted on the wall coming down to the altar and outward toward the people. So you see the concentric ribs moving out toward the people sitting and out into the world. The temple is Christ's body. And we do our best to make this point, to confess this truth by the way in which we, with greater or lesser resources, build our churches. The church is the house of God because God in the flesh is here for us to receive. So let our joy today not be mingled with any sorrow. Set sorrow aside. For the greater, the greatest of all the temples, and really the only temple, which was given into death for us, which was destroyed for us on Good Friday, and built itself again, for Christ built his own body again on Easter Sunday, is here. And for this reason, we receive his abundant mercy, his life, his salvation, being brought into him who is himself the temple of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let my prayer be set forth before the as incense. And the Lord of
Seeks thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may, may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Seeks the Almighty God unto thy church, thy Holy Spirit, and the more wisdom which cometh down from above, that thy word as becometh it may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve thee, and in the confession of thy name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Let us give thanks. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, from whom without ceasing we receive exceeding abundantly all good gifts, and who daily of thy pure grace guardest us against all evil, Grant us, we beseech thee, thy Holy Spirit, that acknowledging with our whole heart all this thy goodness, we may now and evermore thank and praise thy loving kindness and tender mercy, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thine only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that we, being defended by thee from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ our Savior, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. 